Hi everyone. In this video walkthrough, we're going to be discussing how to conduct ordinary least squares linear regression in Python. So this in this walkthrough, I go through a document that I have posted. It's a Python Jupyter Notebook, as well as HTML document that shows you all the basic steps that we'll be taking to conduct linear regression. Um, so please read through all the details. Um, there's kind of important information about how to interpret things, how to do different things, and what means what. But for this walkthrough, we'll go over the high level, and then you all will be um, looking at how we do linear regression, what commands we use, the coding and the packages, and then you'll conduct your own on a different data set. So the basic model for linear regression is detailed here, and it can have a number of explanatory or independent variables. But in this case, we're going to stick with one. So just um, y is some function of x, and x has two coefficients, beta naught, which would be the y-intercept, and beta 1, which would be the slope. And we're going to be using ordinary least squares, or OLS, linear regression, to calculate these coefficients, the intercept and the slope and then conduct um, significance test testing, confidence intervals, and the like with the coefficients as well as with a linear model. So from a probabilistic standpoint, the linear regression model says that um, we're finding the expected value of y, the dependent variable, given x equals some value of x. And so what that ends up meaning is this regression line that we create, which has these beta naught hat, which means a, a predicted value or an estimated value of the parameter in beta one hat. Um, those two coefficients multiplied by a given value of x predicts a mean value or an expected value of y. So I'm going to just scroll down to our linear regression model um, right here. The black line is the linear regression model. That is the mean value or the mean response that we expect. So for a given value of x, what's the mean value? So that line is fitted in a way to represent the mean or expected value of our dependent variable. OK, so going back up here, we're using a data set that is relating fish length. So these are, um, I think there's some kind of a bass fish. Uh, and this is data collected from a lake in California. So it's largemouth bass. And then they measure the length in millimeters and then um, send it off to a lab that used mass spectroscopy or spectrometry or whatever the word is to um, identify the concentration or measure the concentration of mercury in milligrams, sorry, that is micrograms per gram. So very low concentrations of mercury establish themselves in fish tissue um, and it bioaccumulates. So that means that little particles of mercury in the sediment or water um, are eaten up by bugs and smaller fish and bigger fish. And then by the time it gets to these, these keystone predators, the concentration builds and builds and builds. So that's bioaccumulation. Um, so if you eat fish recreationally, you could be eating mercury. And this is important from a public health standpoint to understand. It's hard to measure mercury. You have to send it off to a lab. It's expensive. But it's not hard to measure length. And so these data give us a, an easy relationship to calculate the mercury concentration or the expected mercury concentration based on a given length. So here's what the data look like. We've got length in millimeters on the x-axis. That's our independent or predictor variable. And then we have our dependent or response variable on the y-axis. So linear regression is often performed to understand relationships between two things, something that we can measure and something that we want to know more about so that might be harder to measure. So what we see here is a roughly linear relationship. It's positive. Um, and we're going to first evaluate the correlation coefficients. This coefficient tells us the um, essentially how strong the correlation is. Is it positive or negative? If it's one, then it's a perfect all the points line up perfectly in a line. If it's zero, then there's just a, a random scatter. And so we're going to use, um, we import the data frame using pandas package. And so we read the CSV file in, 
from the pandas package. Um, this is located in the same folder as this Python uh, script, Jupyter Notebook script. And so we don't have to specify the directory. And then down here, using uh, the correlation function, we apply it to the fish data set. Um, so this is the, the data frame, the pandas data frame, and then it's a pandas function. So we just do fish.core. We tell it to use calculate the Pearson correlation coefficient. There are several, um, and this is the one that we learn in class. And we get a correlation coefficient or rho of 0.85. So a pretty strong positive linear relationship between the two. Now we'll go into actually conducting the linear regression analysis. We're going to be using a new package called statsmodels.api. We haven't used this package before. Um, you can do linear regression in SciPy stats. However, it doesn't have all the bells and whistles and um, diagnostics and results that, that this package does. So we're, we're learning a new package here. It's a little bit clunky, I'm not going to lie. Um, but here's, I give you the code to, to make it work. So first thing we'll do is extract length out of the fish data frame and call that X. So we'll extract concentration and call that Y. So we're calling the column names here. And then there's this funky thing we have to do, which is saying, okay, we're going to add another um, uh, coefficient to the model. So right now, if we were just to do the ordinary least squares model fitting on X and Y, it would just give us Y is equal to beta one times X without an intercept. Um, but we want an intercept in this, it, it fits better to the data. So this is adding um, an empty variable that will allow it to fit an intercept as well as a slope. So we call that big X and then our capital X. And then now we run this OLS function on Y and X. Notice the order. Um, and then we, we run fit. So we want to fit the linear model to this data. So what we'll now do is display the results of this regression by printing out the model summary. So notice that I'm calling model, I'm making a new object, which is this linear regression model. It contains a bunch of information in it. And then I'm saying, okay, give me the summary from model. So Model is my very or my object, and then summary is the, the function, the commands that I'm applying to it. So we get a bunch of results here, and don't expect you to know everything. However, I am going to highlight some important things here. So we've got, and I've got it written down here. So you can go back and read all this information, but I'll just highlight it here briefly. So our dependent variable, that's the predictor variable, is concentration. So it calls that out. We're doing a ordinary least squares, least squares fitting. Um, there's a, an analytical equation that can be calculated to find the slope and intercept of the model. Um, it gives us our number of observations. It gives us the residuals, um, degrees of freedom for the residuals. That'll be used in t-testing later, but it's basically the number of observations we have or number of xy pairs which is 20 minus the number of coefficients. In this case, we have two, the intercept and the slope. And then the degrees of freedom for our model is one. It's a linear model um, with one predictor variable. We get the R squared value. This is the coefficient of determination, which tells us the percent of variability in the response variable that's explained by the predictor variable. It's different than the correlation coefficient. It's calculated differently. But it's still pretty high. Uh, this is about 73% of the concentration is predicted by the fish like. So not too bad. The adjusted R square value is for multiple linear regression. So say we wanted to measure the length and the weight. Um, of course, those two are related, but maybe there's some other variable from the fish. Um, it could be how old it is, it could be from what pond it came from or an elevation. There's some other variables we could throw in to better predict concentration. The F statistic, this is something we haven't learned, but essentially what this does is tell us, is our model significantly different from a null model? 
And in this case, our model is y is equal to beta naught plus beta one times x. And the null model is simply a constant value at the mean of the dependent variable. So instead of a sloped line with an intercept, this is saying, is the model of just a, a flat line better or not? And this is telling us, well, we've got a really high F score and a really low P value. So that means that our model is significantly different from the null model, which would be just a flat line. All right, the last thing we'll talk about are the coefficients and the statistics that we calculate on them. So for each coefficient, we get the estimate. The intercept is negative 0.73, and then the slope, which is associated with our length. Um, so this is the coefficient that we multiply by the length, beta or beta one. That is 0 0.0032. Okay, so those are our two coefficients. That's our linear model. We get the standard error, which would be essentially kind of like the, the standard deviation divided by square root of n. There's a different formula for linear model coefficients, but that's the same idea as the standard error that we would have for a mean. We can calculate the t-score for these values, and essentially we're comparing these values with zero. Are they different from zero? Um, do we have significantly real values, essentially? We get the probability value, or p-value, so very small p-values. And then we get a 95% confidence interval. So it, this is showing us the upper and lower uh, values of our t1 uh, minus alpha over 2. So if our coefficient for length, this is our slope, that's the one we're most interested in. It's got a confidence interval of 0 .0, uh, is of so the, the mean or predicted value of the coefficient is 0 0.003. And then our confidence interval is plus or minus 0 0.001 for that value. So that's the, the range of the slope. Uh, essentially, the true slope of that relationship would be within that interval 95% of the time. OK, so how do we use this model? Well, uh, we're looking at the slope term, or beta naught, or beta 1. And that's our slope. So what it means is that for every millimeter or unit increase in fish length in the predictor variable, mercury is expected to increase by 0 0.0032 micrograms per gram. So if I were to say 10 millimeters increase in length, then it's gonna be 0 0.032. So it just gives us the increase in the dependent variable as a function of a unit increase in the independent variable. So we did the model, but now we wanna know, is, is it reasonable to conduct linear regression using ordinary least squares? And for this ordinary least squares, we have a couple of considerations. One is that our scatter plot of the residuals should be uniform across all the values of x. Now, residuals are just the difference between the observed and predicted values. And so the difference between um, right here, the vertical distance between each one of these points and the regression line. So some of them are positive, some of them are negative. So we want to see this uh, value. So we have our fitted values, and we've got plus or minus um, for those. And so these are all the, going to be all the different values of, in this case, y. Um, and we want to see for hetero, for homoscedasticity, we don't want to see a change in variance. Basically, we don't want to see kind of a cone in either direction where it goes from low to high variability. So you look at this, and you're like, yeah, it looks pretty variable. Maybe there's a little bit less variability for the high values. I don't see a very strong signal here. So we can say that it's homoscedastic, homoscedastic, or the variance is fairly uniform across all values. The other thing we want to look at is the normality of the residuals. How normally distributed are they? And so we're doing a QQ plot. And as long as these points line up along the line fairly well, we can say it's it's roughly a normal distribution. So these two check out. Okay, so in summary, uh, based on the p-values for our coefficients and the model itself, we can found that our linear model is significant, but different from a flat line at, at y bar. And we also found that our residuals are normally distributed in homoscedastic. That means that 
They meet the assumptions of the ordinary least squares linear regression model. So we're good. If they didn't, there are other methods we can do. There's um, things called robust linear regression. Um, there is non-parametric regression that doesn't require normal distributions. There's quantile regression, which involves fitting a line to the median values rather than the mean. So there's a lot of other methods we can use um, that we don't have time to talk about. All right, so here, take a look at this. This is how we report results in a very rigorous way from a linear regression analysis. I won't read it here, but you get uh, essentially what we're doing is identifying what the data are, what the correlation coefficient is, and then noting that our um, slope parameter is significantly different from zero. The last thing we'll do is construct confidence and prediction bands for the mean response and for future predicted values. So I'll let you read more about what the definitions of these are, but we've learned about confidence and prediction intervals, which is essentially, uh, uh, you know, and, and a confidence interval in this case would be a interval with a certain confidence level that we expect the mean value, the true population mean value to exist in at that 95% level. Um, and in this case, it would be the true value of mercury concentration for a given value of X. So that's gonna be our confidence interval. But then if we calculate that for every value of X, we get a band. Um, same for prediction interval. In this case, it would be a single predicted observation of mercury concentration um, at a given value of X. And so we construct prediction interval for that single fish, say a fish of a given length. And then we calculate it for all values of X and get a band. All right, so I'm gonna jump down here. Um, what we have is basically these, these two bands, confidence and prediction bands. And what they're showing us is that if we pick a certain value of fish length, we can slice up and then come across and end up with a confidence and prediction interval for that particular fish length. So if we calculate it for all fish lengths, we get these bands, they, uh, they're curvilinear. And so they widen the farther you are away from this middle value, which is the mean fish length and the mean mercury concentration. So that's kind of our central value. And then as you go, they, they widen and expand. So I don't have time to go through, I'm not gonna go through all the steps here, but this code is what allows us to create the confidence bands. And um, there's a little bit of funkiness because we have to access certain columns and certain arrays to get them. And it's a little bit different for the confidence and prediction bands. But if you follow this code, and if, if um, X and Y are your independent and dependent variables um, from above, then you should be fine, and you shouldn't have to really change much for this code to do it for other things. So that's the plot with the bands. And then I've got some extra code here at the bottom that allows us to create intervals or, or, or print out the intervals for a given value. And so I chose 450 millimeters, and then I'm using this code to print out the confidence interval for the mercury concentration at 450 millimeters, and then the prediction interval. Um, so again, you shouldn't have to change anything here other than the um, particular value that we put in here. The funky thing about this is that we have to feed the code, not just one value, we have to give it a value for the constant and a value for the slope. Um, I don't know why it's set up that way, but it is. So here 450 is the X value that we wanna create a prediction for. One is just ignore that. That's based on um, something that the code needs and we don't actually need any information related to that. So just, just a heads up that we're extracting values for 450 related to the confidence interval and prediction interval.